Hello, thanks a lot for joining. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about email and like pushing the envelope of email to see what we can really do with email code in the modern day. So um, I'm gonna assume that a lot of the people watching this are more focused on web. So you're more web developers rather than email developers. And um, So I'm gonna do a quick like poll, quick show of hands. Um, who has built an HTML email at some point in their career? Now I can't see you, um, but you can make, maybe post something in, t in the Slack channel if you like. Okay, quick show of hands, or you can just hold your hand up in front of your computer. Um, now keep your hand up if you really enjoyed that experience. You think, oh, email's brilliant. I really liked working with email code, and this is much more fun than web, and I, email's the best. So I'm going to assume most of you still have your hand up because you all love email, but uh, I mean, there's a chance some of you don't, uh, haven't yet been converted. So I'm going to try and convince you throughout the process of this talk. So my name is Mark Robbins. I am a software engineer. I work at Salesforce. Um, I work on email code. I, all my work is email based. I haven't done a web project. Well, I did one this year. It's the first web project I've done in, in quite a while. And, it's a, and it was a web project for sharing email code. Um, so. Um, yes, it's very email focused, specializing in uh, interactive email and accessibility in email. So as we go along, um, I'm going to be in the Slack channel, so please feel free to post your questions. I'll try and answer them as much as I can. Uh, I'm also on the Twitters, m underscore j underscore robbins, and I am on the email mark.robbins at salesforce.com. Now, because I work for Salesforce, I've got a quick disclaimer that any purchasing decisions should be made of products that are currently available. Right, anyway, so when I start talking to people about email and email code, um, a lot of people think that it's still stuck in the 90s and you can't really do much with it. So I don't agree with that. Like, is HTML email still stuck in the 90s? To answer that, you have to quote the dance sensation of the time to Unlimited and say no, no. No, 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 no. It's not as limited as you might think. I'm not gonna say there's no limits. That would be ridiculous. There are some limitations, but we can work within those to do some really cool stuff. So one of the first things that always comes up is table layouts. Emails need table layouts. You need to use tables for everything. Well, do HTML emails still need to use table layouts? Yes, but it's only for Outlook desktop app on Windows and the Windows Mail desktop app. Now, in 2007, when Outlook 2007 came out, Microsoft made the decision to switch from using Internet Explorer as the rendering engine to using Microsoft Office as the rendering engine. So this is the equivalent of maybe browsing a web page using Microsoft Word. So, um, <laughs> that because of those restrictions of that rendering engine, we, yeah, we do need to use table layouts for those email clients, but they only count for about 7% of users or 7% of opens. So um, I'm going to keep referring back to market share and percentages throughout this talk. Uh, this is all coming from uh, one place, which is emailclientmarketshare.com. So um, this company Litmus great, um, do some email analytics and at the end of um, every month they put together the analytics that have gathered for all these different companies around the world and they publish it on this website, emailclientmarketshare.com. Um, so the statistics I'm looking at at the moment are from March of this year, March 2021, and it's 1.15 billion opens. Uh, I look at this chart every month when it comes out and it doesn't change that much. I think when I started doing email well, eight or nine years ago, uh, outlooks were about 9%, it's now dropped to about 7%. Um, and it, there's no big change. More, there's more of a change between industries and depending on your specific list you're sending to. Um, but as a, as a global stat, that this is what we have here. 7% um, is, is a good, good guide. So if this only works, this is only required for 7% of your users, 93% of the recipients don't need table layouts. So we don't need to build everything with tables and then we can build everything with divs and then have tables as a fallback. Like it shouldn't be a standard. This is this is a, a fallback that we have we need. Also, people tend to use a lot of tables in their emails. It's not needed that you don't really need it. You only need it when you're changing like a width, uh, background, or doing a multiple column. 
uh, part of the layout. All of our email clients, we can use div layouts. We can even use like HTML5 semantic landmark type layouts in, in some, but that's not recommended because when those tags are stripped out, then we lose the element. We also lose any class ID, uh, style, any other attributes are on there as well. So it's, you're better off using role attributes if you want to get that um, landmark uh, semantic code going in, which which is good and you should do. So how do we work around this for um, the MSO outlooks? So we can use um, what's known as ghost tables with conditional comments. So if you, uh, back in the day, you were using IE conditional comments for targeting Internet Explorer, MSO conditional comments are basically the same concept, but we can use them for Outlook. So MSO is Microsoft Office, it stands for. So here in this code sample, I've got uh, an MSO comment around table opening tags, table TRTD opening tags, and then I've got a div, and then I've got the closing TDTR table uh, closing tags. And that all that table code is wrapped inside conditional comments. So all the other email clients, the other um, 93% don't care about that. They're not going to see that, so that's all fine. Um, and then I've got the div inside for those clients and the table the table for the MSO outlooks. I could also wrap conditional comments around the div, so um, Outlook will ignore it. But Outlook's going to ignore those styles that I've applied on anyway, so we don't need to worry about that now. One of the other things people uh, mention about restrictions for email clients is inline styles. Do we need them? Yes, we do. Um, some email clients don't support style blocks, so we have to use inline styles. It's not a lot. I mean, the biggest one is GMAP IMA, Gmail IMAP accounts. Um, these are often referred to as Ganga, which is a Gmail app, not a Gmail account. So if I was to be looking at my phone and I were to look at my Gmail account, that's Gmail. If I look at my Yahoo account, in my Gmail app, then that counts as Ganga. However, if I was to look at my Salesforce account, that is a Google Workspace uh, account. So that is still a Google email account. So that still renders like the regular Gmail. Um, so we don't have the restrictions there. So it's only a small part of Gmail opens where this renders only on mobile apps. So T Online is another one, which uh, a German email client. Also, we have some mixed support in ProtonMail and SFR where it might work in the app, but not the webmail or vice versa. Uh, I forget which way around that is now. Um, so market share for this is really hard to measure. I'd say it's it's likely to be under 2%, um, may, maybe two, may, maybe up to three, but it, it's low. But it's still significant enough for us to want to think about it. So what do we do to work around this? Well, we just set the essential styles in line. As long as it looks fine without the style blocks, then that's fine. It just needs to be functional. It doesn't need to look the same everywhere. Then we can use style blocks to enhance it. We can add some more styles. We can add some, like something a bit more creative, something a bit more fancy there. We can also do things like hover styles, like add, add in some web fonts, uh, some media queries to get a responsive design, some media queries for a dark mode even. Um, using CSS grid, CSS animation, they don't work everywhere, but you can use them in some places and where they do, you're just adding that progressive enhancement. So another thing pe that people say about emails, which um, is you, you can't use relative units, so you have to use absolute units. Well, no, that's not true. Actually, uh, relative units have pretty good support. The things like M, X and percent units have full support. I've not found an email client yet that doesn't support those, and I've tested a lot of email. Um, the one exception that I have found is inside VML code. So VML code is some code that we can use inside of the MSO outlooks. I'm going to talk about it a bit more later, so we'll just skip over that for now. Um, so M units, yeah, we can use those everywhere. Rem units for the root font only have about 80% support, so it's still pretty good, but it's not quite full support. So we can't use them reliably throughout the whole email, but we have got workarounds. But also another issue with REM units is if you're looking across browsers, you're looking at like your Safari, Opera, Chrome, Firefox, uh, Edge, and you look at what the default font size is, it's pretty much going to be 16 pixels across all of those. Some of the um, sort of lesser known browsers might have something a bit different there, but generally it's 16 pixels. Email clients, it varies a lot more. 
So in uh, Apple Mail, it's only 12 pixels as the default font size, whereas something like Thunderbird is 17, so it's much bigger. But that's a concern, the 12 pixels. So if I set my font size to be one rem, then that's rendering as 12 pixels in Apple Mail. And the user hasn't necessarily made that decision to have a small font size, they're just using the default settings. So now they are having very small text and that can cause accessibility issues. So our solution, a way around this, we're gonna set a base font size on the wrapper of the email and then use M units inside the body. So we use M units for everything in the inside, but on the outer wrapper, we put wrapper div around the whole content and we set our base font size. So we actually set three font sizes here. So first up, we set our fallback. So font size 16 pixels is for email clients that don't support REM. So that's like 20%. Then we set font size one REM for the email clients that do support REM. But then we've got the issue of the small default font size. So then we set a third one and we use max. We use max 16 pixels, one rem. So if you're not familiar with max, it's um, CSS property that we can give an array of units, an array of values to this. Um, and then as it's rendered, um, it will look at the array there and it will pick the largest of those. Um, so if I'm setting 16 pixels, one rem, if the value of one rem is less than 16 pixels, it will use the 16 pixels value. If it's more than 16 pixels, it will use the one rem value, whatever that may be. So now we can provide uh, a much more accessible font size and sizing throughout everything. We can use you know, all our spacing, all our everything sizing with M's inside it based off that root font size that we are, we're setting on the wrapper. There is a bit of a restriction. If a user has chosen a small font size, a font size less than 16 pixels, we're not going to respect that. But if they have a larger font size they've chosen, then we do respect that. So it's not perfect, but it's I think it's a good compromise. So next up, absolute positioning. So can we use position absolute in email? It's only about 50% support, but we can fake it we can get a very similar effect by using styles that are supported. So think, what does position absolute do? What, what is it we're trying to achieve by doing that? So first thing, when you take an element and you put position absolute on it, it takes it out of the flow of the document. So the, any content below is just gonna move up and take up the space that it was there. So we can do this if we wrap our element in a div and we add a max height zero and a max width zero. Uh, we don't need to use both. Uh, using both will just take it out completely. You could just use one or the other, depending on what you're trying to do with it. But now that's taken it out of the flow of the document and the content below it is going to move up. Um, so next, we want to look at how we can move the element. So we've, we've taken it out, out of the flow, but we want to move it to a new location. So instead of using like top and left, we can use a margin top and a margin left to move it to our desired location. If you want to position it from the right, we can do a float right and then use a margin right to move it from there. We can't do left and right at the same time. Margin bottom, we, sort of, we can't really do it from the bottom. We could probably do something uh, with some flexbox or some grid hacking, um, but that's not going to have as much support as, as this is on its own. Um, so then we've got our, our element, we've taken out the document flow and we've moved it to its new location, but we might have some issues with Z-index now as the content which was below it has now moved up to cover, cover it potentially. So how do we work around that? So Z-index doesn't have great support, but you can engage Z-index without giving it a value by using position relative or by using opacity with a value less than one. Uh, both of these methods have mixed support in email clients, but if we put both them together, then that they overlap enough to give us really good support. Um, with the opacity, I've said it's 0.999. So it is slightly transparent, but personally, I can't see anything, but my eyes aren't the best. Um, but yeah, I can't, you can't really notice it. Um, but don't be tempted to add an extra value. So if it was 0.9999 with four decimal places, then mail.ru is going to round that number up to one and then we then it doesn't engage the z index so it will just fall back behind so uh, keep it to 0.9999 so this works really well across most email clients except going back again to these mso outlook clients so this is where we can use vml so vml is vector markup language 
so it's very similar to SVG in a lot of ways. So actually, back in uh, 98, 1998, um, there was a proposal to um, bring this out and diff lots of different like vector imaging languages were pr pr proposed. Uh, W3C looked at them all and then decided just to create a fresh one, but, but influenced by all these other proposals. So that's where SVG actually came from, which came out in 2001. So VML was sort of developed and uh, submitted in 1998, but development ceased as well in 1998. They didn't really take it much further than the initial stages. Uh, officially, it was depreciated um, in IE9, but it is actually still used today. So um, if you go into Microsoft Word and you draw a shape, and then you export that and you save it as a um, as a web file, then you look at the code, you can actually see the VML code in there. Um, but what's interesting for us is that VML works in Outlook, so we can do some things there. So on the, on the right hand side there, I've got a uh, code sample um, of some VML code. So what's interesting here is I'm using position absolute. So position absolute does not work in, in Outlook regularly, but it does work if you use it inside VML code, then you can use position absolute. However, as I said before, we can't use M units here, but we can use pixel units. And because uh, Outlook is one of the clients that doesn't support REM units, then we are effectively using a fixed, um, fixed height unit anyway. So we can convert that ourselves. So 2M will be 32 pixels. So if we put those two pieces of code together, there we go, and it works. And it works really well. Um, the, it's a lot of code, I will admit that, and it's not that easy to control, and it, it, you know, it's, it takes a while to sort of get into doing things like this. But it is possible, and that's just what I want to show, that it is possible. We can do some cool things. So um, we could do this on the web with, by just writing position absolute, uh, top 2M, left 2M, and we'll get the same effect. But this works in email, and it's it's cool. But So it's not something I use often, but it is just a handy tool. So this got me thinking. If we can position things on top of each other, we can position shapes on top of each other, we can maybe draw a picture. And maybe, look. so I started thinking about CSSR. I love CSSR. There's some people doing some really incredible stuff with it uh, on the web. And um, so I, I wanted to see, like, is this possible in email? So I start off by drawing some shapes. So just a quick caveat that MSO Outlooks, I'm going to talk about them in a bit. So for this works everywhere else. So we'd have a div, we have a height 2M, width 2M, and a background of blue, and we have this, we've created a square, we've drawn a shape, brilliant. Stick a border radius on there, we've got a circle, amazing. Triangle. Um, now this is a the hack. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with it. Maybe the, the, using um, borders to draw a triangle. So here I've got a border on the top and a transparent border on the left and the right, which sort of bring it in, and no border on the bottom. And my my element has no height and no no width, so it sort of collapses down the to the point. Um, here I've done that by using a div with no content and setting it to inline block, so it does sort of collapse down on the height and the width. So if we're using our, our fake absolute positioning technique, we can draw a couple of shapes, put them on top of each other, and we've created this little avatar here. So um, here I've just got, yeah, two, two shapes, so one sort of circle for a head and a rounded rectangle, I guess, for the body. So how are we gonna do this in for the MSO Outlooks? Well, let's take it back again to VML. VML is actually quite cool. So to start off with, let's look at SVG. So I um, I built uh, this, or drew this shape in, in Figma, exported it as SVG. Um, I have, um, and then there's the code for it. And now I've manually converted it to VML. So that's the VML code. Now, as I said, VML and SVG are, are quite similar. Um, SVG is part, in part based on VML, I believe. Um, so if we look at this here, so I'm, in the VML, I'm, I'm combining two shapes, so I want to group them together, so I've wrapped it in a V group. And I've set on that um, a width and a height of 500 and chord size 500, 500. If we go back to the, v, the SVG, 
Then we have the width and height 500 and a view box 0, 0, 500, 500. So that's the same, although view box has got four values um, and the chord size has only got two. If we wanted to get those other two values, we can add a, a, another attribute onto the VML to get those as well. So we can replicate that. Now for drawing the custom shape, sort of the body shape that I'm using here, uh, we have using a path element uh, with a D attribute on there setting the, the values. In VML, we have V shape attribute with a, a V shape element with a path attribute. And actually the numbers are pretty much the same. There's a couple of differences we need to, to change to make it work. VML only accepts whole numbers. So we need to round off all those uh, decimal points. So we've got whole numbers there. Also in SVG, we've got uh, V and H shortcuts. So to sort of keep a constant or uh, vertical or horizontal position. Um, so we need to work those out. So we just look at the previous coordinates to know what that is pulling through. Um, and so we can create our, our VML path. And then both of them are opened with an M, but uh, VML, uh, SVG is closed with a Z. VML is closed with an X to return to the start point and, and an E to stop drawing. Um, for the head, uh, I'm using a V oval. Um, in VML and we're using an ellipse in SVG. So the ellipse is sized from the center of the shape so um, and we're using the CX and CY um, but VML we're giving it the full height and full width so we just double those values. Uh, other things on here like um, stroked F is stroke false because uh, VML defaults to stroke uh, on a shape, whereas uh, SVG defaults not to. Uh, so also we're using fill color here for VML rather than fill in SVG. But there's, they're quite similar. If you start looking at the code you can, and you're familiar with SVG, you can sort of understand it a bit. So I wanted to draw something. I wanted to draw something cool. So I thought, what do, what do I want to draw? So I'm a bass player. Um, I play a Rickenbacker. This is a beautiful bass guitar, and I love it. Um, so I wanted to try and draw it in CSS. So this is a CSS drawing of my guitar. And this works in email clients. This works in a lot of email clients. So I tested it and there's a few different screenshots there. I've got Apple Mail, uh, Outlook, uh, App, um, Yahoo Mail, Gmail, um, Samsung I think is there as well. So we've got a few different email clients and it just looks the same in all of them and it works and it renders and it's brilliant. For Outlook, I did the same technique. I took a, an SVG, I drew an SVG shape, exported it, manually converted it to Figma. Now that uh, Outlook um, base is a bit more simple than the design of the CSS one, um, but actually the VML could potentially be more complicated. It could have more detail to it because it's a uh, much more flexible language than trying to do this in CSS. However, Manually converting SVG to VML takes a long time, and I've spent quite a few hours building the CSS version. Um, I sort of ran out of time and patience to do any more than that. It was just more of a proof of concept. Uh, so one more example of this I want to show. as GMX. <sighs> GMX doesn't support border radius. So we get some kind of 80s Lego guitar, I guess. Um, it kind of looks cool. It's sort of recognizable, right? You know, work with me here. It looks like a guitar, yeah? <laughs> um, but it, it, so it's not perfect, but it's it's pretty good and it works in a lot of places. GMX is um, a German email client. I don't know if they've really got much presence outside of, of Germany. Um, so yeah, but there might be some other sort of um, email clients that I, I haven't tested in. There's thousands of them that might also have this but generally the support is pretty pretty good so next up I want to talk about interactive email now this is probably what I'm best known for so what is interactive email so this is an action taken in an email that triggers an event without leaving that email so traditionally in an email in when you're sending an email the main purpose is often to get a user to click on a link to go to the website and do something so the idea of interactive email is we can bring some of that do something into the inbox. So we can engage the user earlier. We can give them something more to do in the email rather than just click through to the website. 
So it's done using user action pseudo classes. So things like hover, focus, active, and checked are the main ones we use. You can also do things like focus within and target and stuff like that, although their support is not quite as good as, as these four are the, the main ones we're focusing on. So often we're combining these, particularly when we're using checked, we're combining this with sibling selectors. So we're using the plus for like uh, the next sib direct sibling or the tilde for like a general sibling some way down the, down the line. Support for it's pretty decent, 57% of email opens support interactive email. So we've got uh, Apple Mail on desktop and iOS. We've got Samsung Mail, Thunderbird, AOL Mail, Yahoo Mail. Uh, they're both sort of Verizon, so they're grouped together that way. And Outlook. But this is not the MSO Outlooks. This is Outlook Webmail. This is Outlook uh, PWA. This is Outlook on um, Android, Outlook on iOS, and Outlook on Mac. So most of them, but actually the market share is less, unfortunately, but um, it's pretty pretty good support here. 57% of email opens supporting interactive email. So I'm gonna do a quick uh, demo and show you some emails. Let's have a look. If I drag my inbox in over here. So I've got this open in Apple Mail. So the interactions, I like to break it down into two sort of groupings of interactions. We have fleeting interactions and we have lasting interactions. So fleeting interaction is hover, focus, and active. So hover will um, be when you hover over something. So these are fleeting because they're only true. The style selector is only true for as long as the action is taking place. So hover is while I'm hovering. Focus is while it's in focus. As soon as you focus on something else, you lose it. And active while it's clicked. Um, we can do some things like with transition delay to sort of fake it and make it look like it's lasting a bit more, but it's still it, it's still fleeting. Um, interesting here, you can combine hover and focus if you do focus first and then hover. So that can be used to do some, some trickery. Then our lasting interactions, these ones are a bit more definite. Like a, a hover, you can easily, a user can easily trigger that by accident as they sort of move their mouse over it. A lasting interaction, something like a checkbox or a radio button uh, using a checked selector, the user has definitely made that decision. The user has clicked on this checkbox and it will stay, that style will stay true until they click on it again to unselect it. So the same with radio buttons, they can click on it, but only one of them at a time will stay true. So how are we gonna use this in an email? So here we've got uh, a little, um, email for Northern Trail Outfits. This is a fictional brand we use at Salesforce. So um, I've got a little hover function on this add to cart. It's just, it just emphasizes to the user that this is a clickable button. It encourages that engagement a little bit more. Um, then we've got a little hamburger menu at the top here. Love them or hate them, they are, they exist. Um, and we can do that with the checkbox. So when the, when the checkbox is checked, it opens up and we can see uh, some navigation there. And when it's unchecked, it's hidden away. Again, we've got the uh, details, so we can show some more details. We can click show details and we can get a bit more information. And then we can click hide details. We can hide it if we want. And then using those again, there's checkboxes. And using radio buttons, we can do a little image gallery. So we have two images at the bottom there and three at the top here. So we can just jump through and click on these images. So depending on which radio button is selected, it's going to change the image at the top. Uh, so this is like, it's a nice way of laying out an email. So if we would send this um, and we had maybe, it's starting to look a bit busy when you've got both the details open. If we were to have all those photos showing, again, it's more busy. So it's being able to like narrow down that content to get the cleaner design and less clutter on the screen to help the user engage with it. So next up, forms in email. So what do I mean by forms and email? And it's just an HTML form, an HTML form that is completed inside the email, then submitted. HTML forms are amazing. They're great. They don't really need much else to work. You just put your HTML in and submit and it, and it works. It's magic. Um, so this is done with like form input, select text area elements. You put them in, um, select an endpoint to send it to and hit submit and it sends the, the information off. So one thing worth mentioning is post submit is a bit limited in its support. So we use get method for submitting the forms. 
Now that means that when the, the form is submitted, all the information that is entered is put into the URL string and taken through to the landing page. So that is visible. So there are some you know, privacy security concerns around that. Um, but one thing we can do is we can think about it as um, if it's a text input, then that is going in as it is. But if we're using like a select or radio button, we can slightly obscure that information. So instead of using a name and value of um, what's your favorite color and the value of red, then we could say question one, answer two. And then it's not exactly uh, explicit what, what it's saying through that, but it's just a way of um, obscuring it a little bit. But as I say, text inputs are always going to show as they are. So form support, 84%. That is winning. We are really good for uh, email form support. So these work in, um, it's very similar logos to before, but we've lost two. We've lost the Outlooks, unfortunately, and we've lost Thunderbird, unfortunately. But both of those have quite small market share. What we've gained is Gmail, and Gmail has a lot of market share. So that's pushed us right up to 84%. So there's not many where we need to put a fallback in. But for the fallback, we just give them a link back. This is what people are doing currently. Give a link back to uh, a form that you can fill in online. So let's do a demo of some forms. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen forms before. Here's an email. Um, I've got a tent here. Um, let's give it a four out of five. Got a little hover effect on here just to show the stars. Four out of five, uh, review title, nice tent, uh, review. Uh, it's huge. It is, it is a massive tent. Um, I must admit, I did not buy this tent. Uh, then if you hit submit, then that submits that data through and we've got the review there. And these perform really, really well. They outperform uh, just sending a link to, to a review form like dramatically. Now, there's a few reasons, I think, for that. Like this is, um, it's changing the question. It's instead of saying, would you like to leave us a review? It's saying, what did you think? So it's a bit more of a direct question. Also, it's much more transparent. If you ask me to click on a link to go through to a website and do something, I don't know how long this form is. Is there lots of questions? But here I can see there's just three simple questions. So nice and simple. So um, forms work really well. We've, it's something we built into Salesforce. We built it into the Content Builder. Um, so it's like a little drag and drop editor. So you can just use them really easily there. And uh, yeah, people love them and it's doing really well. And one of the things we talk about a lot in email marketing is personalization. And you can't do much with personalization unless you know something about the user. So you can just ask them, send them a, a, a survey, say what you're interested in, what do you want to hear from us about? So next up, AMP for email. So um, a lot of you may be familiar with the AMP project. Um, so AMP for email is a, ver is a, a version of that. AMP for email allows senders to include AMP components inside emails. So yeah, as I say, a lot of you may be aware of AMP and accelerated mobile pages. It was um, set up by Google. It's an open source uh, project. Um, so we now have a subset of those components that we can be used in email. So people have a lot of opinions on AMP. Um, some people love it, some people hate it. There's some of the concerns, maybe not so relevant for email. Some might still carry through. Um, personally, I love it. I am a bit biased. I'm, I'm part of the uh, AMP for email working group, so I, I am quite biased on this, but I, I love it. There's some really cool stuff you can do with it. Um, so to send an AMP email, it's not like completely open. Not everybody can send it. You need to register. So you need to register and be approved to send AMP emails. As part of that as well, you need certain um, like certification like uh, DKIM, DMARC, SPF, and have all of that authentication in place already. And then you get registered and then you get approved by the email clients and then you can send AMP emails. So it's um, there's a lot of like obstacles to stop spam. Um, but it's it's not that complicated of a process if you are a legitimate sender. So what with AMP emails, we can do interactions like we can with HTML emails, but just a little bit more. We can do form submits like we can with interaction with <laughs> HTML emails, but a little bit more. Also, these form submits are, are post and it keeps the user inside the email, so it just sends it off. 
but then we can return some content there. So you can actually use it like a search search box. So you can type in and then it'll, it'll send back a JSON uh, file with some information. Then we just lay that out using Amp Moustache inside the email. Really cool. Also, we can get live content. So we can get, use live content again using an Amp List and that requests, when the email is open, sends a request for a JSON file from your server and you can update that in real time and then send it back and have live content into the email. Um, oh, also with the form submits, it does keep the user in an email with a post submit, but we can fake it so it acts like a get submit and redirects to an endpoint. So we can recreate that experience we have in the HTML email uh, in AMP email as well. So we have, have to have that extra flexibility. So the way it works, AMP uh, uses a third MIME type. So multi-purpose internet mail extensions, MIME types. Currently, uh, emails, when you're sending an HTML email, you're going to include an HTML version of that email and you're going to include a plain text version. Every HTML email should include a plain text version as well. So now we can have an optional third MIME type as well. So we can now add our AMP email as well. So this completely, you code this completely separately. It's a separate file and then you just put those three separate files bundled up together and sent off as an email. So support for this, um, it's currently working in Gmail, in mail.ru and Yahoo Mail. Yahoo Mail is just on the webmail at the moment and AOL Mail is coming very soon. Uh, again, that will be to the webmail first. So Yahoo and AOL, are both Verizon um, media and so they are sort of very similar. So it's coming very soon to AOL Mail. So this accounts for about 35% of email opens. Um, those stats are including AOL because in the tracking, Yahoo and AOL, um, because they are both Verizon, they are tracked as the same and they look the same in the tracking. So about 35% of email opens will, will have AMP support. And then the fallback for where AMP isn't supported or if users turned it off, you'll just get the uh, HTML email. So let's look at some AMP demos. So let me get my Gmail inbox over for you here. So first up, let's look at this store locator. So this was built by my colleague Stephen. Um, so we can look up a store and find where our closest store is. So enter a zip code. Um, this is uh, US based, so I have to use a US zip code. So 90210 is the one that I know. Um, and then we're going to set a radius that's 15 miles and then limit results. We want to see more than 10 results of stores. Find our stores. Now that form is submitted and then this response is returned here. If I was to change it to um, five miles and then we can adjust there and it just doesn't, we didn't find any stores within five miles so we can adjust it. So it's pretty cool. So this is just a form that is submitted and then a JSON response comes back in. We use Amp Moustache to do this layout and we can have all our response in there. So next up, I want to show, this is an appointment booking. So here we've, we've bought a new bike and we want some help booking a service for it. So we can find an appointment. So when this email opens, it lo loads using an AMP list to pull in the available appointment slots. So then we've got, let's book something for Saturday and let's go uh, to one of these Chicago ones. And as we're booking, clicking here, we can see this updated live at the bottom there. The appointment will be on Saturday at 10 a.m. And then we click book appointment and it sends that off, confirms it, and then returns it and says, your appointment will be at Saturday at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in one day. Oh, just, um, this is not live, this is pre-recorded, so that one day is actually accurate. <laughs> um, so um, if for whatever reason that wasn't, um, somebody else had booked that at the time, then we can send a, another response back and say, oh, sorry, that somebody else has booked it, so try again, and we can give you a, another opportunity to select an appointment. But the important thing is here is that when you open the email, that availability is live. So we can't really do that. We can't show live availability without something like this putting in live data. One more example I wanted to show you um, in my inbox here. I wanted to think about email and what can we do so an email doesn't necessarily look like an email. I wanted to draw this like book. 
so I've this magazine layout so we can just click and turn pages like that and flick through the pages um, also I've got a range selector here so I can just dive through the pages like that I'm hoping this video is coming through smoothly because this is a really smooth uh, animation and which I'm something I'm very happy about uh, also we have a, a number input at the top so I can just jump straight to a page so I'm going to go through to a code view of this so we can see how this works a little bit more. Um, so what we have, we have uh, an AMP state. We're setting a variable of page number to 1 when it's opened. Then we have our two inputs at the top. We have a number input and a range input. Um, both these default value to 1, minimum 1, maximum 10, because we've got 10, 10 pages. And then we're using this value page number here. This is a bit of AMP code. So this means when the page number changes in the range selector, then it will change in the value of the number selector will change. So we're doing this using this at the bottom here on input throttled amp set state page number. So we're changing our page number to be equal to the event value as number. So as we change the value using this, then we're setting the page number variable to be equal to that value. Now, based off that, we have our pages. Each page is a div with a class of page on it. If the page number is equal to two, we set the class to be page open. Otherwise, we set it to be just page. So we're changing, we're adding a class, and that's how we're doing this animation, just changing the class on the page numbers. Um, we also got some like ARIA hidden stuff going on there as well to help the accessibility. So we're hiding the content that's not visible. So for the 3D page flipping animation, this is all just CSS. I'm a bit obsessed with 3D CSS. I love it. There's some loads of really cool things you can do. I've built some, some stuff. I'll share some more things. I've built like a 3D game that you can play in an email as well. So here, when the page has got three states. So we've got a page which is open. So that's page to open. We've got a page which is a sibling of that. So a page which is behind the open page. That's going to be a page on the right-hand side of the book. So that is um, this one, page open. Uh, sibling page and then we've got page which is not open which is a I've, I've written that sort of a long winded way um, where I could just have it on the default styles of it but these um, so we have three states of a page and we can have three positions of it so when the page is open we have it rotate y minus two degrees so that just lifts it slightly off the background when it's a sibling of that so it's a page behind that we have it rotated minus one degree so that's lifted slightly off as well and if it's uh, otherwise, then we have it flipped over. So it's minus 179 degrees. So I'm not using um, zero and 180 degrees or anything like that because CSS animation tends to flicker quite a lot. And it has some, some issues with the way it's sort of as it, as it moves. So we can, do, we can do things like just lifting things off slightly and then using this translate Z as well. I'm sort of 0.1M, 0.1M, minus 0.1M we can adjust things and move them around slightly so they don't flicker. So if you don't, if you use exact numbers and you have two things together, then they, it, it gets confused and it slightly overlaps them. If you separate things a little bit with, with that, then it works and it, it, it works much more smoothly. Um, so there we go. I'm just going to show you one more example here. This is a scratch off, scratch to reveal. So here I'm just using my mouse to scratch off and you can see it's scratching off there and I'll just do a quick scratch click the animation there so we can see this is simply if I just remove that we can see I'm using a sort of getting that gooey SV gluey CSS effects using CSS filters so if I remove that you can see it's quite blocky and it's just on hover I'm hiding these and then I've got a little animation when that's triggered so I just put the filter back on there and you can see that working so uh, I am running out of time so I'm just going to do one more bonus demo quickly because Harry loves it and because he asked me so nicely. I'm going to show you that this email, this presentation rather, is actually in an email. So if we go back to my inbox, we can see it's up here in the inbox. If it loads, there we go. And we can tap, tap through the pages. So basically just drew this in, um, did this layout in uh, Google Slides, um, exported each slide as an SVG, and then 
uh, uploaded it and so she put it into an email, associated each image with a radio button. And while that radio button is selected, then we can view that. So thank you very much. Um, I'll share the code for this as well um, in, the, in the Slack channel. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that and please let me know any questions. Thank you.